Good evening, everyone. My name is Janice Mathis, and I'm executive director here at the National Council of Negro Women, where we are headquartered at the historic Darcy Irene Height Building, 633 Pennsylvania Avenue, halfway between the White House and the United States Capitol. When you're in Washington, okay, make sure you come and you see this historic building. Now, tonight we are in for a real treat. Our friend and our supporter from the Coca-Cola Company, Therese Thompson, who's a senior vice president, I believe, and I won't go into her bio because somebody else is doing that, but we've known each other for quite a while, and I'm thrilled that she is here to present to us this evening. We'll get started in just a moment. We know we've got more people signed up who are attempting to phone in or dial in on their computers. So if you're patient with us, we'll come back in just a minute and start the program. While we're waiting, one of my favorite subjects, of course, is National Council of Negro Women. You probably know that it was founded in 1935. One of the principal aims of NCNW when it was founded way back then, 83 years ago, was to combat lynching. Fortunately, lynching is not much of a problem in the United States anymore, but we still work to lead, advocate for, and empower women of color, women of African descent, their families, and communities. We do that in a number of ways, what our chairman, Ingrid Saunders Jones, refers to as four for the future. Four for the future are simply the pillars on which we build our programmatic work, and it starts always with education with a particular focus on STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. We also focus on eliminating health disparities. Right now we're engaged in a groundbreaking research study called All of Us, which will make sure that the uh, solutions and therapies that we get for our ailments are those that are precisely tailored to fit our needs. We also work to inspire public policy and community engagement, civic engagement, social justice, those things that are so important to our quality of life. And you're here because we focus on entrepreneurship, financial stability, economic viability among African Americans, and really for all people. So with that having been said, we will convene in November at the Grand Hyatt in Washington, D.C., a beautiful facility for our 80th National Convention. I'm sorry, not 80th, 58th National Convention. November 9th through the 11th, we hope you'll join us. And we've got something new this year, and that is a pitch competition. Some of you will be asked to present your business ideas just like you're on Shark Tank, and we've got some cash prizes and some great judges, but most importantly, some really high-level coaching to help you reach your entrepreneur aspirations. I think that our moderator has joined us. William, are we ready to get started with the show? Yes. Yes. I don't know whether I'm muted. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes, we are ready to get started with the show. I want to thank everyone for um, joining us this evening, and I want to thank Clarification and Mediation for being our technical advisors. They do such a great job. They're based in Atlanta, and they make sure that these programs go off without a hitch. Sometimes there's a hitch, but it's behind the scenes, and we hope you don't know exactly what it is. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening. Her name is Avery Allen. She is the founding, a founder of A. Allen Co., a consulting firm that specializes in brand management, advertising, marketing, social media management, and event coordination. Avery is a 2015 graduate of Howard University. She also earned a master's degree in communications from Clemson University. And she did what I did as a young person out of graduate school. She started her own company, and she's now representing several local and regional firms in Greenville, South Carolina, where she's from. She was a Annenberg Fellow and a Magna Cum Laude graduate of the Howard School of C. So we're delighted to have Avery Allen, one of our former interns, as our moderator this evening. Hello, Avery. How are you? Hi, I'm doing good. I'm excited to be here with you all today. Thank you. So we're ready to go ahead and get started? I think we are. 
All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm, um, as Dennis mentioned, I'm Avery Allen, and I will be introducing our keynote speaker, Ms. Therese Thompson. So um, let me read her bio briefly and share with you all a little bit of her background. Therese Thompson is the Vice President of Global Supplier Diversity for the Coca-Cola Coca Company, leading the organization's efforts to maximize procurement opportunities with diverse businesses as suppliers, contractors, and subcontractors of competitively priced goods and services. As an associate of the Coca-Cola Company for more than 30 years, Thompson has held numerous roles of increasing responsibility, ranging from operations to finance. She assumed her current leadership position in April 2012. Just prior to her current assignment, she was responsible for employee engagement and was a part of the company's global community connection team. Her respons responsibilities included volunteerism, matching gifts, and the company's nonprofit board particip participation strategy. She also served as AVP, exclusive executive assistant of program, it, excuse me, I'm sorry, executive assistant and program manager of Coca-Cola North America Innovation. In this role, she led a major project to design and implement a new product innovation process for the company's largest business unit, in addition to leading strategic initiatives such as the Innovation Capability Development Retail Transition Lead and Learning Lab. Thompson also ha had a senior role at Coca-Cola in Global Public Affairs, where she led the company's $1 billion empowerment and entrepreneurial program for minority and women-owned businesses. Prior to that appointment, Thompson served as an exec executive assistant to the president of the Africa Group for the Coca-Cola Company. Thompson also held progressively responsible finance roles at the company. She was a controller for the Coca-Cola Trading Company and the financial services manager for, of the Africa Group. Before coming to the Coca-Cola Company, Thompson was employed by Price Waterhouse as a senior auditor. A certified public accountant, Thompson earned her bachelor's degree from Morgan State University in 1981. And so, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Ms. Therese Thompson. Thank you, Avery. Mm -hmm. One minute for um, technical. I think I can. Okay, here we go. From beginning. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. And um, that that long dialogue just means that I'm old and I've been around for a while. <laughs> Um, I'm quite honored. Um, I was quite honored when Janet and her Janice and her team asked me to give this presentation for um, this organization, which uh, is near and dear to my heart. Um, and um, we're going to get right into it. And I'm going to take some pauses in case anyone wants to ask any questions through the chat um, capability. But one of the things that I thought was really, really important to say up front is that I know sometimes for small business owners, um, thinking about doing business with a place with a company like the Coca-Cola Company is daunting, and there are opportunities, believe it or not, um, to engage with the Coca-Cola Company, even if that means that you're not immediately um, bringing your services and selling them. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I head up supplier diversity, and I'm not sure how many of you are even even know what supplier diversity is. It's kind of a mouthful and it's not necessarily self-explanatory. But many companies such as the Coca-Cola Company are committed to providing equal access to procurement opportunities. So if you have a service or a product that the Coca-Cola can buy and use, we really want to ensure that all the folks that in the communities and we serve have equal access to it especially if they have businesses that can uh, meet our needs. And in the 21st century, there are a lot of opportunities for small and diverse businesses to meet the needs of the Coca-Cola company. You've got transportation, you've got IT, you've got general administrative. Uh, we also believe in developing supplier partnerships, taking an active role in, in community development. And we also believe that this is not just a good thing to do, there is a return on our investment for doing this. Um, our products are sold across the globe and they are sold um, sometimes in ex excess or uh, disproportionately when you look at the population and populations which um, uh, NCNW serves. So it is a good thing to do, but it is a good thing for the business. Just for those of you who might not be completely familiar with supplier diversity, we have a little video 
um, that we show, which gives you, which will give you a very quick snapshot of what supplier diversity is. Okay. Is it going to work? I okay. hope so, because I'm excited about it. I know. It worked earlier today. I'm, oh, here you go. Okay. Diversity and inclusion is at the heart of our brand promise and always has been. It's in our DNA and shows up in how we operate in the more than 200 countries across the globe. We see it come to life every day in the people who drink Coca-Cola products. They come from every race, ethnicity, gender, background, and walk of life. And more and more, we're seeing diversity among our suppliers. That's because the Coca-Cola company is committed to being a world-class leader in supplier diversity. But what does that mean exactly? It means that we want to give all suppliers equal access to purchasing opportunities. It means that we strive to make sure supplier participation reflects the world's diverse business community. And it means that we take an active role in promoting economic development. Diverse suppliers include businesses that are owned by minorities, women, disabled veterans, and people who identify as LGBTQA. Diverse suppliers may also include certain categories of small businesses, as designated by the Small Business Administration. Supplier diversity matters because, as a company with huge buying power, we can make a positive economic impact on the value chain of diverse businesses. And when we do that, we can help lift up communities and families around the world. Supplier diversity also matters because it's a profitable business strategy. It drives innovation. It leads to healthy competition between our vendors, and it opens up new supply channels for the company. The numbers speak loud and clear. Globally, as of 2014, female consumers control $20 trillion in annual consumer spending, a number that's expected to grow to $30 trillion by 2019. And by 2028, they will control 75% of discretionary spending worldwide. In the U.S., multicultural consumers are 120 million strong, and their buying power has increased from $661 billion in 1990 to an estimated $3.3 trillion in 2015. And it's expected to increase to $4.2 trillion by 2020. African American, Hispanic, and Asian consumers alone will amass over $4 trillion in buying power in just the next couple of years. And by the year 2060, these groups will have achieved explosive population growth. So to add value to our business, we're committed to empowering those businesses that best represent the consumer base of tomorrow. Our supplier diversity plan begins with making supplier diversity a priority in our supplier sourcing. We encourage businesses to register and look online for opportunities. And we include diverse suppliers whenever we send out requests for proposals or RFPs. In addition, we implement supplier development opportunities for our diverse suppliers to improve their capabilities, capacity, and effectiveness. We want our diverse suppliers to be competitive in the global marketplace. Also, as part of our plan, we track supplier spend so that we always know how effective our program is. We also support our suppliers who have their own supplier diversity programs, which lets us cast an even wider net. And of course, to continue learning supplier diversity best practices, we partner with a number of external advocacy organizations. To learn more about Coca-Cola's commitment to supplier diversity and how our supplier diversity program works, click on coca-colacompany.com slash supplier diversity. So, as I said, hmm. okay. Advance. Sorry. Um, Ms. Can I um, interject with a question really fast? Um, I think I ask, yeah, please do. Um, I wanted to, before we get a little further in the presentation, I wanted to um, ask how supplier is defined. Just even from my standpoint, I always felt that didn't relate to me because I was like, oh, I don't have cardboard box, I don't have a warehouse stock. Um, but how? Um, is supplier defined and could you give some examples of the types of products and services large corporations might be looking for? Yeah, so it, it, it runs the gamut to be um, perfectly honest with you, Avery. And it is daunting for many folks, but for example, I'll name some examples which um, may surprise you. So um, one of the things that we are is a major marketing company. 
And so obviously we hire major marketing agencies and the like that may not be in this audience, but through those agencies, we hire models who place product within our advertising, et cetera. Um, we also, uh, a, a big space now or a big area that a lot of diverse businesses are, are in social media. So we have, um, so even though we have our traditional PR and uh, agencies like that, we really are trying to um, target and engage with the millennial consumers, multicultural consumers. As many of you know, um, African American, Hispanic, young consumers are really uh, trendsetters. They are the ones that, um, you know, you have a lot of people on reality TV who've appropriated a lot of that culture. And so we want to know how to speak to those folks. So social media, digital marketing, et cetera. But then you've got your bread and butter things too. Um, so you have um, trucking. Now, one of the things that I'm really excited about and um, don't want to get into, get too technical, and sometimes I tend to do that. That's why I brought the video. But the Coca-Cola company, when you see the red trucks of the Coca-Cola company, everybody thinks about the Coca-Cola company and they think about the company that's headquartered here in Atlanta. But what you don't realize is that those trucks, for, for the most part, probably 80% of them are actually owned by our bottlers. And our bottlers, um, as of uh, actually late last year, none of them except our Canadian bottlers are owned by the Coca-Cola company. Mm -hmm. And we actually work with, um, that's environmental friendly, turning off the lights. We actually work with those bottlers to help them identify diverse supplier opportunities. So bottlers are local. And so bottlers would hire folks like um, landscapers, uh, pesticide folks, uh, folks who do grading and construction and um, low voltage electricity and plumbing and things like that. So although um, those opportunities aren't necessarily opportunities that the global Coca-Cola company could benefit from on a smaller scale, but with, that, with, but with being able to work with our bottler network, there are a lot of folks who produce services, et cetera, that can engage, not necessarily with the Coca-Cola company, but with what we call the Coca-Cola system, which includes our bottlers. Does okay. that help, Avery? Yeah, that's very helpful, um, because it does show the wide variety that so the term supplier mm -hmm. um, covers. So thank you for sharing that. You're very welcome. Um, so are you ready for the Coca-Cola company? And that's really at the heart of what we want to talk about here. Whether you're a large supplier or you're a small supplier, there's some certain fundamentals that you should um, think about before you approach the Coca-Cola company or you approach your corner bakery. You know, um, do you have a fit with our business? Have you done your research on the, comp on the company? Do you know if your product um, meets our needs? Uh, more than likely, if you're selling hair care products, um, it's probably not a product that the Coca-Cola company would buy. But if you understand that we have a supplier diversity function and, be, and within that supplier diversity function, we also try to develop small businesses. Um, we have development programs. We actually have a digital training session called STEP. And so even though we may not be able to hire your goods, we are committed to developing diverse suppliers. It's very important to us when we work with diverse suppliers that they're certified and we can support, provide support to that. I know a lot of small businesses don't even understand what certification is or aren't even aware that certification exists. But that is a way to assure that a diverse business is legitimately a diverse business. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention when Avery answered the question, I tell you, things are moving so fast in the business world that if you have some sort of innovation, we really want to know about it, especially if it's innovation that will help us. So, for example, Amazon has completely changed the way companies do business. Folks like yourself, if you're producing things that can go on a retail shelf, can work with an Amazon. Companies like Coca-Cola are fighting for that space against suppliers like you because Amazon has a different model than the Kroger's of the world, the Walmart's of the world, et cetera. So if you have any type of innovation that you think might help business commerce, 
let the supply diversity department at the Coca-Cola company and other companies know it, because not only do we bring diverse suppliers in, but we have incubators. Uh, we do pitch contests, we support pitch contests like the one that Janice mentioned earlier. We have um, uh, partners, nonprofit partners that we work with who are trying to develop small suppliers. So there is a lot of opportunity and innovation is key. It's one of the biggest selling points that I make when I'm talking to my business leaders about why they should do supplier diversity. And then, you know, even though I have shared with you, there are a lot of opportunities for small and medium businesses. You know, capacity and financial capability are really important. And one of the things that I encourage, and actually Janice alluded to it, is that if you are a person who it has a small business or a diverse business, or even if you're not that small, but you're a diverse business and you're smaller than a major company, you know, look at B2B before you try to approach a Coca-Cola company. And what I mean by B2B is look at doing business with your counterparts, your small business counterparts. Try to grow your business that way. Get all the knowledge that you can, can around finance and capability. Understand when you need to have access to, um, to financial capital to grow your business. Um, and what do we expect from suppliers? Um, and that's, you know, and that's very, very obvious things that you know, but I want to reemphasize them. So in addition to the normal things, we do want to ensure that if you are a business that has a workplace, that you have responsible programs, we want to make sure that you're complying with laws and regulations, because when you're a Coca-Cola company, you have our brand. Suppliers making a mistake generally mean that the Coca-Cola company has made a mistake. And we're kind of the big pocket, so people come against us. But in addition to that, you know, we we want what you want when you, you when you work with your suppliers. We want exceptional service. We want your deliveries to be on time. We want your production to be on time. We want short lead times. You know, we really don't like to carry a lot of inventory. We really want um, our businesses and suppliers that we work with to be able to deliver those things on time and the shortest period of time allowed so that we can sell our pro products. And we need flexibility um, to meet our changing requirements. And along with innovation, I always say to the leaders that I'm talking to about using diverse suppliers and small business suppliers is diverse suppliers are, the, if you were to go into a dictionary and look for adaptability as it relates to business, I think diverse businesses and small businesses if successful, are adaptable, and they do bring cost savings and innovation to large companies such as ours. Um, quality, obviously, is a very important um, thing, and obviously, you guys get that, or you wouldn't be sitting here on this conference call. You're trying to improve um, what you do and what you offer to businesses. Um, and cost, I mean, that's a reality. I know when I first entered this job about six years ago, a lot of the diverse suppliers were concerned that companies were like consolidating, only using large businesses, but cost is a reality. So if you are in a business or you are thinking about going into a business, think about something that even if it's not a digital business or if it's not e-commerce or it's not something that um, relies on that, that you have a way and a means to bring your service to companies by leveraging and benefiting from this large digital space. I mean, even like, for example, um, there is a woman that I'm starting to talk to. Her name is Talia Waji. Some of you may know her. She has a major natural hair care business. And I went to her and, you know, and because, you know, there was a time when I was in this business, I went to very traditional businesses. I went to her, I went to her conference and I was thinking, oh, this is going to be a small kind of informal conference. It was a major, major happening. She draws in 30,000 women. She's an African-American woman who's been at this for 20 years. And so she's very successful. She obviously earns a lot of money with her products and her um, conference. But she actually called me and said, I'm so glad you were able to come. I was glad you were able to speak. I would really like to you to be my mentor. And I really want to understand what is new in this industry and how I can convert my business. So she, right now she has a manufacturing warehouse and she's really thinking about how she can get rid of that and, 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 and um, outsource her distribution. So 
there are ways for small businesses and diverse businesses to be competitive. But I think the key is to be innovative. Think outside the box. Don't think of yourself as a small business. You know, get that vision board out there. Figure out where you want to be in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And you can do it. Um, do you want to, Avery, you want to break here or would you like me to keep going? Um, yes, we've gotten a few questions, um, and I would like to get those in really quickly. Um, we have two questions um, about the regional contact. So first, I'm question, losing. I'm losing. I'm losing. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, let me know if I'm coming in and out. I also have a tendency to sort of whisper, so please call me out on this. You're very, you're um, very clear. So, does Coca-Cola have regional contacts to assist businesses with understanding and applying to be listed? Um, as RFPs are issued? Okay, that's a very good question. So um, the Coca-Cola company does not traditionally advertise RFPs. We do get involved in electronic auctions and bids, which generally aren't that conducive for small businesses because all they're focused on is price. Um, we do have a website, which I will share with you, and it does allow you to register on our supplier diversity portal. It doesn't make you a, um, an approved vendor, but it does give us ex, um, access to your information. And when RFPs do come up, uh, we will consider you. But you know, as I tell everybody, make sure that when you're entering that information, you're very crystal clear, that you highlight what your skills and responsibilities are, and that you over communicate so that when we're doing that search, we find every single capability that you have now as it relates to this new kind of thing that's happening with our business and the fact that we've got these bottlers that are regional and local depending on what your business is if you make contact with us and all of my team doesn't don't have a big team but we do try to respond to our emails and we do look at our database and if you have a service that you believe could help our bottlers, we will put you in touch with them. The other thing that I say to people is, you know, I really respect the entrepreneurial nature, and I'm not saying all supply diversity professionals are like this. So if you have a hustle and you've made contacts and you have some ideas about opportunities um, within our system, either here in Atlanta, even globally or regionally, let me know what they are and I will pursue them because it's hard because you know I don't know everything. I know what my procurement and business leaders tell me about, but there are so many opportunities in the Coca-Cola company that say are below five hundred thousand dollars. And I love it when a diverse supplier has done their homework and they can tell me kind of generally where something might be. I mean, um, just the other day, um, a, a woman-owned business um, called me and said, "I understand that you guys are having." a marketing fulfillment product for promotional items. I did not know about it because it was kind of a discreet project. They were moving quickly on it. And so I was able to get her into that bid just because she called me and asked me. And I just didn't have a sight line to it. And that happens a lot of times. So be aggressive, be aggressive. Um, we will let you know when you're being too aggressive. And as I said, I can't speak for all supply diversity functions, but if you've done your homework, if you've done your research, if you're highly capable, if you understand how to solve solutions for us, most of me and my colleagues will open up um, our ears to you and listen to what you have and try to uh, match you up. Any other questions, Avery? Yes, um, we have other questions. Um, one of them is they're asking about, um, I think a few slides back, you mentioned certification and, and they want um, this participant wanted to know if that means DBE or SBE sort of etc uh, certifications yeah actually that is such a timely question that that person must have a little bit a little ESP so the slide that we're on right here are the external organizations that we work with who do certification so we really uh, look for certifications from WeBank NMSDC um, CAMSI, which is a Canadian organization, USPAC, which is um, Asian, NGLCC, and there's a veterans organization that's emerging that's not on this slide. Having said that, um, I do know that there are other certifications out there, government certifications, et cetera. We generally 
do not accept those and count that spend because they generally don't go through the rigor that these certifications do. But don't let that stop you. So for example, if you're a DBE certified business and you fall under one of the minority categories, women categories, et cetera, or even if you don't, um, you can still come through our portal, share with us what you think you can do. And if there is a real opportunity for you to do business with us, I wouldn't turn you away, but I do encourage you to get certified with these organizations. And I would look for that to happen within a reasonable period of time, one to three years. But at the end of the day, my mission is to support um, those businesses that are underserved. So unless that business, um, one, doesn't have a fit or a match to us, I'm going to talk to them. And two, I will tell you this. If you're doing a lot of business with us and we brought you in and you weren't certified and we allowed you to um, classify, as they call it, I will be pushing my um, procurement people to look for someone who's certified if five, ten years from now, your business is still not getting certified. All right. Well, thank you. That's all our questions right now. So let's move forward in the presentation. So I don't need to cover this page. Um, here are some of the uh, resources that we have um, at the Coca-Cola Company. So this is our supplier diversity registration site. Not only can you enter your data into our portal, as I explained before, but it also has um, information about our development program. It has information about where we are, what events we are attending. We also, if you're a diverse supplier of ours, and, we're, and if we are um, particularly proud of the work that we're doing with you. Not only do we have an annual um, award ceremony where we might recognize you, but we also will um, profile you on our website. Um, we have a, a focus on the programs that we're doing with women. And as I said before, we have partnered with an organization, WeBank, and we have developed a woman of color program focused specifically on women of color. And the reason we do that is that we're not, um, being discriminatory exclusive, but there are a couple of reasons behind that. And actually Janice and I talked about that briefly before we um, signed in. One is that the data shows us a couple of things. One, it shows us that women of color businesses are growing exponentially. And one of the reasons is one, these women wanna have, they have a product their stories that they wanna offer. But as we all know, women still are not treated fairly in the workplace so many of these women are finding better job opportunities for themselves by becoming entre entrepreneurs the second thing is is that again it's just a fact when you invest in women you know in comparison to their counterparts they're going to put far more back in their community and develop their community and companies like coca-cola you know, whether we say it all the time or not, we've got to have healthy communities to be prosperous. And so what I noticed is, so I've always said to people, if you get pressure out there, you know, a lot of folks are concerned that maybe diversity programs are more focused on women um, who aren't of color. And so as I started really look, and I'm a CPA by training, by the way. Um, so when I started looking at the numbers, I love data. I saw that our portfolio wasn't really balanced. We had a really good number of men of color. We were growing our in, uh, gay and lesbian. Women um, um, who were not um, ethnic minorities were growing exponentially. And that's all good. You know, I'm not going to take any business away, but the statistics were calling out. And so I went to WeBank the women's organization and say, look, your ecosystem is not healthy. All women are not prospering equally. And you guys have really benefited from this space. So what can we do to continue to grow women businesses and to deal with what we know are gaps with some of these other businesses? So, um, so long story, short story, we have this program and you can find out about it um, on our website. I love this. I was just telling uh, the team, I just love my job, so I could talk about it for a really long time. And so again, just to reiterate, not only are we focused on increasing the spend, our dollar spend with um, diverse suppliers, not only are we focused on um, 
interacting with organizations like NCNW and promoting ourselves. But we also have a very strong focus on development of diverse suppliers. I talked to you about our Women of Color program. We have an overall program called STEP. It's a digitally based um, training program for entrepreneurs. It came out of our women's initiative, but it's for all entrepreneurs. And we actually partner with organizations like the Urban League. Uh, have not, we do a lot with NCNW. Janice and I have not gotten an opportunity to talk about it, but it's one of those uh, tools that we have that we would love to leverage with NCNW. And you go on to this tool, and you can actually get to it through our website. And we're going to be launching a new version of it August the 15th. And it has four components that you can take your time and go through digitally. Marketing, leadership, access to capital, and how you contribute back to your business. And so the first iteration of it was good, but we felt like we could be better. And so we've got that. And then last but not least, for businesses who've done business with us, and maybe they, you know, they can grow just a little bit more, or maybe they need some skills that can help them, or some businesses who maybe competed in RFP with us, but missed it by just a little bit. We actually have an internal, very customized development program that we do. We don't take in more than seven businesses. We partner actually with the National Urban League on this because they've got a great entrepreneurial program. And we take these businesses through a year long program to really focus them on how they can do business better with the Coca-Cola company or get business with the Coca-Cola company, but also to do work um, with other corporations because the Coca-Cola company and all corporations don't want to have suppliers dependent on them. We don't want to have a supplier that 80% of their business is the Coca-Cola company. So we're very, very focused on development and building a robust pipeline of diverse suppliers that even if they're not, even if they're not opportunities immediately, we have a go-to um, pipeline when we do have opportunities that come up. I'm Avery again. I know I talk a lot. Do you want to break in or should I go to the next slide? Um, I think we can go on oh, to the uh, next. Oh, do we have any? Oh, we do yeah, have I'm sorry. Well, this is William. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I just wanted yeah. to say that uh, for the attendees, that uh, there are two ways that they can ask questions. Uh, on their control panel is a pane that allows you to type in a question and submit it. Uh, there is also an icon. Uh, on the left side of your control panel that will allow you to raise your hand. Raise your hand, we will try and uh, and uh, call on you to ask your own question. Uh, uh, sorry, I just want to let attendees know that. Okay, thank you. And I wasn't running away, but the lights in my conference from here, uh, they go off if you're not moving. <laughs> so I may get up again. <laughs> Um, so we do have a couple questions. I'll, let's ask those really quickly. Um, there is a question about wellness. Would uh, wellness courses be of interest to your company? As a new business launcher, do you prefer we come in with certifications or will it vary on the surface? Okay, so two parts. One, um, ideal situation is for a supplier to come in with certification. But one of the things that I'm very focused on, because if I, if I wasn't, I really wouldn't be developing, is that businesses are at different stages of development, different stages of cash flow. Like I said, I'm a finance person, so I kind of know if someone's being honest with me. So sometimes that may not be, for a smaller business, the first thing that they do. They may have to, and, and actually, if, if they can explain to me, you know, kind of their investment strategy and their cash flow strategy, and this is why, and this is when they plan to do it, I can live with that. So ideal situation, would love for you to be certified. As it relates to wellness, that is an area that is of great interest to the Coca-Cola company. Uh, we actually are really in the business of finding sort of the most innovative beverages out there, that really have um, additional nutritive qualities. You know, we have a great water business. And so we really do want to be on the leading edge of the next great beverage that brings health benefits too. Having said that, we also, through our HR organization, do have a focus on wellness. In the spirit of full transparency, and to be honest, Training is one of those things now that has gone the way of digitization. So we do have some, some very select 
training classes that we might have where a person may come into our building. But honestly, we're looking for partners. So we are looking for folks like NCNW that can help us build curriculums for our external constituents. Uh, we have a, a, what we call Coca-Cola University. So it's all digitally based training that most of our training goes through. Now, what I can say though, is that those training programs have to be designed by folks and um, and our HR, pers uh, our HR teams do have relationships. So how might that be an opportunity for you? Two things, one, I don't think there are any immediate opportunities. Two, and I tell diverse suppliers this all the time, those areas are very relationship-based and they aren't like big, big dollars. So they're not the things that I'm gonna put a lot of resources on. But one thing that I will tell you is that this is very timely because like a lot of our company and a lot of companies, we've just done a major reorganization. So I'm actually meeting um, in the ne next few weeks with the gentleman who's responsible for HR services and training would be a one of those. And I'm gonna make the case for him, not necessarily to say you need to use X, Y, and Z to go supplier, but I really want to, in the next 18 to 24 months, have a session with the HR um, leadership and senior leaders so they can see the breadth of services that diverse, oh, I'm sorry, that diverse firms bring in the training area and the consultancy area, et cetera. Because I think when something is like relationship-based, if you don't really know someone and you've got uh, infinite budget and you've got to have uh, immediate results, it's not malicious intent. It's not that they don't want to use these suppliers. They just don't want to take a risk. So my hope is that over time, so I see this as a very long-term strategy. It's not going to probably be immediate dollars in it um, for anyone on the phone right now, but it is something that I think, I do think it's an area where we've got gaps and there are probably a lot of innovative programs and training, health and wellness may be one of those. The other thing, like I said before, you know, go to our website, go to, and, and, and we're a part of the Coca-Cola company. Look and see what we're focused on. Uh, you know, most of our um, tabs have contact people. You know, we're out there in the industry. We're attending events, you know, network. Um, you know, I say people, networking isn't like going to a happy hour, after hours, after work, and maybe meeting some business people. It's being very mindful about what your business is, identifying those trade groups and other associations where you can meet people that can buy services from you, where the Coca-Cola companies are, maybe where the Microsofts are. It just depends on what your target audience is. It's really about having a, 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 a call plan. Who is it that I wanna meet here? Who is it that I wanna talk to? If they're not there, who's their company? And who else might I wanna meet to? And you'd be surprised. I mean, there's some really smart entrepreneurs out there that really know how to network and engage. And that, you know, and then if you, and if you, you know, and if you have a company that you know has a supply diversity department, once you've built your strategy, you've made some contacts and you get a sense that maybe there's an opportunity, then call that supply diversity department, tell them what you're thinking about. Because I will tell you, all companies today are looking for suppliers that can bring them differentiating and innovative solutions. Uh, if they're not listening, then they're probably not um, growing. Um, any company that says we've got the answer and you've done your research and you brought a solution to them that can help them grow their business, that, that's just not happening every day. I mean, that's one of the reasons why um, I'm feeling really good about being in this space because I think a lot of my colleagues who make those purchasing decisions are seeing that there's a real benefit in opening up their doors to diverse suppliers and small businesses. Wonderful. Um, we have one more question before we continue. Um, so how much past experience do you recommend a company have before registering um, as a diverse supplier with Coca-Cola? <laughs> that there's no real um, standard answer for that. Um, if you are in business and you've done your homework and you truly believe that you have a solution out there for the Coca-Cola company, you should register in our database. Uh, even if you haven't and you believe that you will or you have services that could provide, but you're not quite ready, still be in our database because we can call you 
if we uh, want you to make a proposal or answer our opinion, you're not ready for it, then don't respond to it. You can say, oh, that's a great opportunity, but I don't think this is the right time. So I don't think that there's any right time to register in a database. I think there is a right time to try to go into a business or make a proposal or sign an RFP. Um, you have to really be very self-aware because you know it's one of those things where if you're not ready, chances are that you're not gonna have as great a probability um, as getting back in. And that may not sound fair, but um, you know, life isn't fair. Unfortunately, it's a uh, you know, it's a it's a race, it's a competition, and so you really got to do your homework and know what you're doing, be you know, before you enter that race. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, that's, um, oh, every before this is Clara. I I have a question about the C three SDI program. I mean, it sounds great. I I love the notion of building this pipeline. How do I how do I get into the program? I mean, what what's the process? Is there an application? Where do I go? How do I get started? How do I get in that program? How do I get in that pipeline? Okay. So, so there are a couple of things. We have the Women of Color program. We have the digital training, and then we support other programs that NMSDC and WeBank do. do. So those are all very much um, I would say democratic and open entry. The C3 SDI program is one where you, you would be recommended for. So you would have either um, worked with supplier diversity and shown us that you have the capability and scale to be in a particular part of our business. And it could be like marketing where you don't have to be large or you have developed a relationship with internal business people or procurement people and they really do believe that you've got potential or you um, were a part of an RFP process and you were number two and you didn't make it because maybe you didn't have the right um, costing model. So that's not one that you can just sign up for. Um, you, if you are in a, uh, if you are in, because it's very limited, uh, in order to do that program right, we can't have more than eight fellows at a time. And to be honest with you with what we invest in it, We've, we've got to be pretty sure that that company can do business with us. So it, so that so that is you know kind of a uh, that that's a hard one. But we still have if you if you go into our website, we still have other developmental opportunities that you can do. But that's not one that you would apply for. That's one that you would have to be recommended either by someone in the business or someone in supplier diversity. And then we go through. And then we actually, as I said. We're in partnership with the Urban League, and I don't know how much you know about the Urban League, but they have like, I think, 15 entrepreneurial centers, and one of their best is in Atlanta. So we actually started this program about three or four years ago, and we tried to run it ourselves. But it's hard to build curriculum. It's hard to have sustainable programs. And their entrepreneurial center, that's what they do. And they already were a partner of ours. So it just made sense for us to connect with them and so we provide the design and the content, and they make it happen. All right, great. Any more questions from anyone on the phone? Or I don't think we have any more on the um, questions pane. So Ms. Thompson, if you'd like to continue. We... Okay, thank you. So this really is just talking about the different approaches that Coca-Cola takes and supplier diversity to work to work our internal systems to help diverse suppliers. Uh, the next thing is we actually have a partnership. Uh, <laughs> probably need to update this slide. We still have the partnership with Now Accounts, but I guess right as um, the previous administration was leaving office, and maybe they probably started it before that, they had a real focus on how companies would help small, medium, and diverse business businesses manage their working capital and give them access to capital. I don't, you know, I don't know how many of you who are on the line are working with corporate America now, but many corporations, including the Coca-Cola company, are extending the credit terms that they have with diverse and small, with all businesses. But it's impacting diverse and small businesses in a very unique way. And it really makes it much more difficult for them to do business and be competitive. So we've done a couple of things around that. In some instances, we will give exception to our longer terms, 
but we've also partnered with a women-owned business that offers payment solutions to small and diverse businesses to help them increase their working capital. And I was, at first when we went into this, I was a little bit nervous because I didn't really want to be in a position where we were selling a financial instrument or a financial product. But uh, so we went slow and we have found that most businesses who have decided to use the service have really benefited. And not only have they benefited in terms of increasing their working capital, but because this instrument does not fall on their balance sheet, it also allows them to use their line of credits and other financial instruments that they have in a very innovative and creative way to grow their business. And it also, they also have a very good um, financial system. So some businesses actually use this as their primary accounting system. And so those are the kind of things that we try to do to support um, businesses, the development program, offering businesses um, approaches to financial access. And then again, and I mentioned this before, our chairman at the, well, he still is our chairman, but in, I want to say, 2010, he made a commitment publicly to empower 5 million women by 2020. And this is done around the globe. Each business unit is responsible for it. I work very closely with our North America program through our STEP program. Actually, NCNW is one of our biggest um, partners around empowering uh, these 5 million women. We've gotten a lot of uh, numbers of women um, counted through our NCNW initiative. And so we really look for opportunities where we can really scale up and provide um, training and business opportunities to women, to women business to be a part of it. So um, our, C, our Coca-Cola um, development program, those small counts when we have a women, woman entrepreneur, our digital training program is a part of it. Um, we also have um, partnerships with um, a number of entrepreneurs where we deploy training programs. And so this is something that we're very, very proud of. And then the Women of Color program that I talked about is under the umbrella of um, 5x20 and STEP as well. Any questions here? Uh, let me check really quickly. I don't, oh, yes, we have one. Um, so I'm a state representative from a state in which a minority, in which the minority women, veterans, et cetera, small business goals are not being met. Is there a way a state entity can partner with Coca-Cola to help um, with meeting state goals and objectives via Coca-Cola's development programs? Are there any supplier networking opportunities or et cetera? That's a really good question. Um, I would say uh, yes. Um, if state has requirements, and, well, I'll give you some examples of some of the things that I've done. Uh, we don't have any just fully comprehensive programs with states, but um, one of the things that many states do that really helps them meet their goals is they actually, in their contract language and in the RFP process, they actually are requiring all businesses to document their supplier diversity programs and to make commitments. Now, obviously that state has to be really fully bought into it. So I'll give you a couple examples where the Coca-Cola company has been instrumental in helping state entities to meet their goals. So one is um, the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport Authority. Uh, Texas, and da Texas and the cities of Dallas, San Antonio and Houston have major supply diversity programs. Um, our com big competitor, Big Blue, was had been in the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport forever. And so our sales team came to us and said, I think if we do something innovative here, it may not be the closer on the deal, but it will help us. So we went in as a part of the sales team and came up with some very innovative solutions. So we actually work with them on developing, um, they have an annual supplier diversity conference we share with them our diverse supplier listing. We bring speakers in and we do a number of other things, but that was a big, big win for us. New York State is uh, very, very strong in this. And they call me up, my account, my account teams there call me up to be a, to present with them every year in terms of what our goals and requirements are. 
And we've actually helped them to identify diverse suppliers in New York that they haven't been familiar with. Again, we will do training programs and the like. Um, Minnesota, um, you know, I don't know if you all recall, but they had one of the tragic, tragic incidents where African-American male was killed by a police officer. And as a result of that, the state got a lot of blowback in terms of what they were doing about minority communities. They used the University of Minnesota, Wisconsin as a, as a flagship. So again, we went in there, we did training, we participated in their trade show, et cetera. Uh, here in Atlanta, Fulton County, we've got one of our independent bothers moving in. This was a territory that the Coca-Cola company owned and the uh, uh, municipal authorities in Atlanta, as, as probably many of you know, because of uh, Maynard Jackson, God rest his soul, is one of the premier places for supplier diversity. And so we helped that bottler get in there. So there are a couple of things that I would suggest that state representative do. Look at those states who do it well. They are always willing to share. And, um, and I don't know which state you're in, but we probably have a bottler there. And if you have some interest with partnering with them, um, I'm happy to uh, connect with you. At the end of this presentation, uh, my email address is here, our supplier diversity email address is there, and I also um, have my cell phone number. I don't answer my phone much, I don't really listen to my voicemails, but I do respond to text messages. <laughs> so I would like to know if I've answered her question or his question, or if there's more clarification that they need. Um, okay, I'm not sure. I don't think I don't, I don't see anything else in the little question pane. Okay. If you would like to follow up with that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll have my contact information for everyone who's on the phone. Okay. So there's a couple of specific, um, well, there was one specific question about um, interior design, if that was something, interior mm -hmm. design, if that was something that Coca-Cola um, would be interested in working with. Um, so I don't know well, if you want to answer people now yeah. or offline. I can answer that question because the, the presentation is almost over. I think okay. we've got half an hour, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, yes. yes, we have used interior design and we've used diverse interior design companies. And usually we would use an interior design company at the beginning of a build out or a construction project. We are well, we, so we are actually restacking corporate headquarters. So the, the, the need for that service no longer exists, but we would have worked with our, our facilities group to look for folks in various areas. There could be an opportunity for one of our bottlers might who may need, like for example, we've got two bottling operations that are building new plants. One is in um, uh, Houston, Texas. They're right now in the building phase, so they're really looking for construction-oriented folks. Design may be a part of that. They're actually having a, um, uh, um, a, tra uh, a supplier fair on August the 23rd in Houston. Um, if anybody's interested in detail, if that person is in the Houston area, they can give me a call. Uh, we've got a um, facility going up in South Fulton County in Georgia. I think they're pretty much past that stage. I don't know if once the facility is built, because they're like manufacturing plants, if they would need a design. So the answer is yes, that is a service that we would use. There's not an immediate need right now, but it doesn't mean don't put you know um, doesn't mean you shouldn't go into our portal. I don't know where you're located, but if we have a bother in that area, it's worth probably reaching out to them. But it really you know that's more of a kind of timing issue versus would we use a design firm or not. And it also depends on what the capability is, how large they are, what kind of clients they've had in the past. Are they industrial or are they more um, uh, you know? residential not commercial so it's a lot of questions but right. um so it's not like just a you know a one you know one fits all answer but that is a service that we actually have used and i'm pretty sure in our atlanta office rebuild we've used design type minority firms to help us wonderful i think this uh, uh person is in we Austin. had a uh, one hand i'm oh, sorry go ahead go ahead mm -hmm. No, I didn't mean to interrupt uh, your answering the question, uh, Ms. Thompson. I'm sorry. I'm good. I was good. Oh, I was All just right. saying. Uh, yeah. We have one one person who had their hand up, so I thought I'd try and recognize uh, Ambassador Cook. Yeah. You have your hand up. Uh, you're unmuted. Would you like to ask your question? 
Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. So it is also a relationship-based business, but I know Coca-Cola does a lot of breakfasts and luncheons and, you know, community outreach. So we have the only Black-owned woman professional speakers bureau, and I was wondering how would we fit in with your particular division or who would we contact in HR? Well, again, um, you can send me your information, put it in the database, and I could bring that up as a potential when I talk to my HR person. Um, where are you located? We're located in Washington, D.C. and New York City. So we're two cities. So, um, so for speakers, is it training or is it like motivational speaking? We do both. We do corporate training and we do motivational speaking. And we go everywhere. We all 50 states and global. So... Um, wherever Coca-Cola is, we can go. Yeah, I, you know, so I think that's relationship-based. The fact that you're in D.C., I think that, um, you know, we, you know, we, we could have a need through our public affairs group. Um, I actually, you know, it's funny you answered, asked me that because I actually was asked by uh, my procurement team who's having a meeting, do we have any recommendations on speakers? Now, what I will tell you, to be really honest with you, and it's probably something you face a lot of time. People don't necessarily appreciate the values of speakers. Right. So when we're looking for speakers. We're looking for people that we generally already have a relationship with, and we may pay their travel or something like that. But we're not big into paying, you know, kind of a fee. I mean, a big fee. Um, we actually are getting ready to have a multi multicultural leadership meeting, and we were looking for speakers at the time. And I don't think we had a speakers speakers bureau in it. But because of our contact, we were able to reach out with people. So what I would say is that's a possibility. Okay. Um, I don't have anything offhand, but you're welcome to email me your information. I can share it with some of our folks in public affairs to see if they're in need for it. And I can look at the list and share it with the lady who uh, wants to have a speaker for procurement. As a matter of fact, I owe it to her by the end of this week. So okay. yeah, so that's again more relationship-based. I don't know if you know anyone at our company um if you've interacted with them and your role as ambassador but be sure if you do that they know that you have that okay thank you i do okay i appreciate it i think yep. that's okay so you know this is really just a recap of some of the stuff that i talked about just kind of getting you guys more grounded in understanding what supply diversity teams do and how you might use them at Coke and other places. But we actually get paid to advocate on your behalf. We, if we feel like you're good or we know there's a need, we, you know, that's unique. Uh, most suppliers don't have advocates other than the folks that they've already had relationships with. Um, you know, once an opportunity is identified, we look in our database, we see if you're out there. Sometimes we might, you know, sometimes, and it's rare, that you know um you're out at a trade show you meet a diverse supplier and you've been talking to your business unit about a need that they have like for example um there's a woman-owned business in chicago they're a flavor manufacturer and we're looking for innovation around dairy flavoring so they haven't closed the deal but i was able to introduce them to somebody pretty immediately because i just happened to be having a conversation with someone um I was pressing my marketing team because they wouldn't, they kind of came late to me for opportunity that they had. So I wasn't able to source any diverse suppliers. And so they came back and said, we're sorry we couldn't do that. But hey, by the way, we're looking for a Hispanic agency that can do translation. And I had just met with a woman. I had just met with a woman at, a, at the HB uh, Hispanic um, uh, Chamber of Commerce, and that's exactly what she did. So now she's competing for an RFP. Um, so yeah, that's what we do, and, and it's uh, you know, you, and I get paid to do that. I can't believe it. Um, and you know, and as I said, uh, maintain communications with supplier diversity. Uh, make sure that, you know, if you, if you have information you need to update on the website, do that. Make sure you're coming to us with solutions. Make sure you understand our business. Because, uh, you know, I have people that come to me and says, well, it feels like we've got to do extra work. And I'm like, well, you know, sometimes you do. It's just like I tell my 21-year-old daughter who's getting ready to graduate from college. 
she says to me, well, I think that guy's a sexist. I said, well, he probably is. So what? Grow up um, and um, understand that, you know, it's just societal. You know, if it wasn't, then you wouldn't, I wouldn't have a job. There would be no need for a supply of diversity. Function. I mean, let's just be honest about it. We, you can get pissed and, you know, stomp your feet and, you know, and kind of, you know, grind your heels in. But, um, you know, um, you know, just, you know, it's, it's, it's just hard work. But I will tell you, the good thing about Coke and many companies like ours, once we've developed a relationship with supplier that consistently delivers, they do have room to make mistakes. They do, you know, we love incumbency. That's one of the reasons why it's a little bit more difficult for diverse suppliers to get into our business. But some of my best suppliers are diverse suppliers that are bringing solutions to my business people. I actually had a situation with, um, you know, our bottles, our plastic bottles, they start in the form of PET, which is like a plastic, it's like a mold, and then we go through a process. And so we had a, um, we had a non-diverse supplier who wasn't delivering. We thought that a diverse supplier might be, and it wasn't that actually mold, but it was supporting that. My procurement guy was like not hearing it. He didn't want to hear it. He felt like diverse suppliers where it was like a community, some kind of welfare program, blah, 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 blah. Did a um, capability session because this was a big contract. This was like $30 million. And these guys came in and just knocked him off his feet, blew him away. So he's one of those kind of guys. So we knew they did a good presentation. I hadn't heard from them like in six months. All of a sudden I get a message from him and one of my peak team people said, I can't name the company. They just got the contract and it's like $30 million in spend. You know, and you know, like anything else, you know, change management, you sometimes have to change people. But once you get in, and you do a great job, um, you know, our people, because again, they like incumbency, they like relationships, will always be there for you. Uh, and have patience. You see that last bullet? Have patience, a lot of it. Have patience. Well, because I tell people, and this is the truth, you know, as I get younger, you know, I forget stuff. And I do like to respond, but before all these emails and everything, I could respond to people in 24 hours. Now I still try to respond within 36 to 48 hours, but I tell people, if I haven't responded to you, send me another message, send me a text. And generally what I will try to do with people is I'll say, well, um, the next two months are just completely full. Why don't you try to get on my calendar in October and November? Uh, and usually I do that one because I know there's not an immediate need. And I do think it's an important part of my job to vet suppliers, stay in contact with them. But, you know, in this e environment, you just get a proliferation of information. You just got to learn how to manage it. So patience is very important. But persistence is also um, a good thing. But stay professional about it. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so that's kind of, um, I think that's the end of my stuff. Here's my contact information. I'm happy to answer any more questions. I'm kind of losing my voice. For those of you who uh, don't live in Atlanta, you know, allergens are just a big part of our problems. I tell people when I moved here 35 years ago, I didn't even know I had sinuses. <laughs> so um, I do uh, have a couple um, more, a few questions just to wrap up. Um, so in your experience, what are um, what diverse supplier collaborations have you observed in or outside of your industry that have worked really well? Um, so that's a good question. Let me think about it. So our food service provider, Thompson Hospital, well, our food service provider is, um, um, oh, Jesus, is Compass. And they, we had a major food service contract, I don't know, about five, six years ago. And obviously we wanted to go with a diverse firm. There are a couple of diverse firms out there, but our folks, our facility folks really wanted someone who was leading edge technology, had some environmental solutions around packaging and all of that. So they really wanted to go with a compass subsidiary. And I said, well, that's fine but I don't want just second tier spin. I said, there's just too many diverse suppliers out there. All things being equal, we need to go for diverse supplier. So when I looked at the business requirements and we did some visits, we realized that 
Compass really was the best solution, but they came back to us because they knew we were really serious about it. And they have a joint venture partnership with Thompson Hospitality. And um, as a result of us pushing and them willing to give a little bit, uh, not only did they get the business and we get about 50 to 60% diverse spend, their business has grown astronomically around not just the food service, but kind of the support of the facility, the catering and all that. And a lot of that incremental business is going to Thompson Hospitality. Um, so that's one. Um, I actually, we actually have our, our temporary labor service. The main um, group is Ronstadt, which is a non-diverse supplier, but they've partnered with a uh, Metasys, which is a diverse supplier. And so when we look at, so Metasys, we get about 40% diverse spend from them, but we also push Metasys to do um, a business, not just with, that's not coming from Metasys, but also to partner with, have a have a broad portfolio of diverse partners that they're um, that they're partnering with, and so they have heard us, and they are bringing in because um, Metasys ha happens to be an Asian firm, and so they've made a commitment to us to not just use the Asian firms that they traditionally use, but to bring in some um, um, uh, Hispanic and African American suppliers. Um, those are the two that I can think of right hand, but I do know there are others that are out there. Okay, um, and this last one is a little bit two part. Um, I know we've been talking this whole thing and sort of been advice that you would give to um, diverse suppliers, but if there was something that our attendees are minority owned, woman owned, LGBTQA owned small businesses would take away from this presentation, what if they can only be be one or two pieces of information that you want to be sure they got and carried with them and implemented into their business, what would that be? Um, preparation and knowledge is essential, which means being digitally savvy and all that. And then the second thing is be sure that you want to do business with a company like Coca-Cola or any other major Fortune 500. Uh, we are very good business to be in partnership with, but we are very um, difficult sometimes to do business with for all the reasons you want to do business with us. You know, we're big, we're used to being catered to, we have extended terms, we um, expect you to move on a dime, but we generally don't. Um, so you really need to do your homework around that and kind of build a strategy of, okay, I want to do business with Coke, but when is the right time to do business with Coke? And I think that, that goes for um, all clients of any size, just in my experience, whether there are two people or 1,500 people employed, they want everything to move fast and they want to, but they mm -hmm. won't expect that sort of patience on the other end. But so thank you. I think that's all of our questions. I don't see anything. Um, Mr. McFarland, has anyone raised their hand or is there any other housekeeping items we have? Well, I am uh, searching very hard for additional questions or people who have raised their hands. And uh, uh, you've done a great job of fielding lots of questions that were assigned to you, uh, Ms. Avery. Well, uh, thank but you. at this point in time, <laughs> you will. At this point in time, I really don't see any more. Uh, we, we do have a couple of questions that, but that are related directly to different services that people um, provide and whether Coca-Cola has a need for, um, I, mean, I guess I could rattle them off and it probably wouldn't take you a long time, Ms. Thompson, to uh, answer yeah. those questions, but they, they're pretty specific into uh, uh, a need for chauffeured black car and shuttle bus services outside of Atlanta. Um, um, I would say yes, and I would say okay. find your local bottler, um, because that's not something we would do centrally in Atlanta. Um, if you need, if you um, have a specific request about an area, um, I don't know of any that are needed at this moment, but I'm sure our local bottlers do have those ground transportation services, and so register in our database, we'll get that information to their database, and we're happy to reach out to see if there's a need for that. Okay. And I think this particular person was um, in Chicago. Um, also, yeah. questions so about a need. 
So that bottler is Reyes. And the nice thing about Reyes is that they do require um, all RFPs considered diverse suppliers. So they do come to us. The, the um, downside to that is they are a very well-established big business. They service McDonald's, Millicores, as well as having a bottle of interest. So they do not change their suppliers much, but they do understand now that they're in sort of more of a consumer facing business and they're both in Chicago and in, on the West Coast, that it's much more important. So they're happy to take um, supplier names an introduction. They have not told me they have that service need, so I don't think they do, but I'm happy to do an introduction if um, the person who asked that question uh, just emails me. Great. Uh, and then generally a need for travel uh, services, either domestic or international. You know what? I would say no, and the reason I would say no is that we use one of the big, um, you know, we use Carlson Wagon, Litton American Express, and I believe right. our bottlers tag onto that system. So uh, probably not um, uh, at this time. Well, that could change, but I don't think that we're going to shift from doing sort of major aggregated travel to more regionalized or local, just because there's so much money um, to be gained in terms of incentives and discounts by doing it that way. Okay, uh, and uh, that is a really at this time. Uh, excuse me, all of the questions that I have. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions come in. Um, okay. So, do the bottlers have their own supplier development initiatives? Um, they have. Uh, most of them intend to um, have supplier develop the big ones. So they're like eight major bottlers that have 80% of the business. Most of them have some version of a supplier diversity function and they work with us. Most of them would not probably invest in supplier development in the way that we do because um, their margins are different than ours. They're more like manufacturing blue collar. Now, what I would say is that we've actually entered into a umbrella agreement with the National Minority Supply Diversity Council. And we're hoping that as we roll that out, some of our bottlers will work with their local NMSDC organizations to support things like the supplier development and diversity. So I can't say never, but I think that supplier development, they're gonna probably rely on us to do, you know, through our different platforms, as well as our larger program and the relationships that we have with NMSDC and some of their affiliates. And are there any um, African American owned or women owned, other diverse population owned bottlers, Coca Cola bottlers? Yes, there are. There are um, two African American owned bottlers. One of them I just worked over the last 12 months to get certified. Uh, they're based in Florida. We've got another one that's based in Canada. And actually, uh, Reyes is um, Hispanic and Irish descent. Uh, they probably won't get certified because of their business structure, but they are, we, you know, we did invest in them uh, because of their Hispanic heritage and um, the fact that they, you know, were doing business with McDonald's. And um, so they're not getting certified, but they do have um, a um, ethnic minority background. And the other one, let's say, let's say the other one is the Heartland, and they're based out of Kansas, uh, Kansas City, I think. And they're okay. also so the the one in Florida is owned by a gentleman named Troy Taylor, who is a finance guy. The one um, in Can, um, I think it's Kansas City. Don't hold me to that. That's owned by Junior Bridgman, ex NBA player, who owns a significant amount of Wendy's and I think Arby's. And he yeah. had to run those off. His kids run those, and now he's running the bottling operation. And then Reyes is um, run by, I mean, Reyes is, I think that their last name is Reyes. Wonderful. Um, and does Coca Cola encourage second tier diverse supplier engagement? We require it. We actually okay. require second tier spend, and we have contract language 
which requires our major prime suppliers to report that to us. We see that as business, we see that as develop, indirect development also. I think it's my last question. Are there any diverse moving companies among your suppliers, as far as you know? When you say moving companies, we actually have, are you talking moving as in relocation or are you talking moving as in freight and trucking? I think freight yes, and trucking. If it's freight and trucking, we do have a number of diverse suppliers and we think there's more opportunity. We have, um, I know we have a Native American, we have two Native American, I think. We've got, we've got some women owned ballers and then we've got probably at least two African American um, trucking companies. Freight is a major issue for the consumer products fund. So I'm trying to find innovative ways to bring more diverse suppliers in. Um, we also actually used a, there's a, a new business. There's a African American general who's created this digital application for finding and identifying the best um, freight services. Um, you know, Uber, Uber has actually Uber Freight. So they're kind of going up against the big guys, uh, but that is a big focus area for us. And we do have actually a woman owned relocation business that moves our employees. Oh. Um, so do you get any pushback um, within the company? And if so, um, how do you deal with making the business case for diverse suppliers? So I guess pushback against- I get no, oh, pushback. I get no pushback at all, oh, no. Um, I get pushed back uh, all over the place. Uh, actually, when I first met Janice, she was pushing back on me. <laughs> and I definitely get pushed back internally. <laughs> uh, so here's what I do. So the business case is obvious. I mean, you know, we've got customers who request that we um, have supply diversity programs. We get requests from RSP. So that's actually a bottom line hit. Um, we know that diverse suppliers uh, have a significant impact on their community. So we do collect, um, we do, I wouldn't say collect, but we do have economic impact studies that show us that. Um, it's an expectation, you know, we are expecting that 80% of our growth will come from multicultural consumers. 80% of our growth, 80% of our growth will come from, and they expect us to do this. Um, we are starting to do metrics to show our uh, business people that diverse suppliers are performing at the same rate or higher. We really believe that we don't have all the numbers in place. Um, so, you know, so yeah, so we have all of that. But to be honest with you, and I think Janice can relate to this because she's been at the forefront all the time. At the end of the day, a lot of this work is. Um, a series of difficult, hard conversations, fierce conversations, um, where you can agree to disagree, you make the case, and where you know you've won is when you're invited back to the continue the conversation or ask to help for something else. And so you've really got to, you, I don't think you can do this job if you don't have passion. You do need to know the business case and run the numbers, but at the end of the day, and you know, there's sometimes like, you know, like 12 years ago, or maybe a little even more than that, the Coca-Cola company was first was was faced with a diversity lawsuit. And supplier diversity was one of those proof points that we could show that we really were doing the right thing in the diversity space. But that's temporary. You can only, you know, you can only uh, twist arms so much. So that was a great boost for us in terms of really getting high level engagement. But you got to come day after day, uh, week after week, year after year, with consistent results, um, credible, um, diverse suppliers, etc. So yeah, I get resistance, but that's kind of um, a big challenge, a positive challenge of the job. And not only do I get uh, resistance inside, but then I'm told by external people what I'm not doing right, how much I'm not doing right, where I'm not spending, uh, why don't we have more ethnic minorities? And so, um, the, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's um, um, challenging, but very rewarding at the same time. Well, thank you. I think that's all of my questions. I really appreciate your presentation. I wish we had like a little applause function to uh, oh. give. Um, I see who answered that question. 
<laughs> so okay. um, I guess I'll turn it back over to Janice for closing remarks. And... Well, thank you. I want to thank you, Therese, for a wonderful presentation. I'm sure everyone learned a lot and enjoyed it. I could tell from the back and forth of the questions and the answers that people were really paying attention. But more importantly, I think I want to thank you for being a believer. You're right. You can't do this work if you're not passionate about it. And Coca-Cola, by any measure, has one, a gold standard program for diverse suppliers and inclusion. And it's part of your reputation. It's something I know that you're proud of and mm -hmm. rightfully so. And NCNW is proud to be your partner in the effort. Yeah, you guys are doing a great job, Janice. Um, I was, I mean, I, I know you're good and I knew you would do a great job, uh, but you know me, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I'm one of these people, I kind of take the win and I leave and I'm always looking for what's not right. But I've been extremely, um, uh, you, you've kind of continued to exceed expectations. And this is an organization that's been great. It's always been great but you've really taken it to a new level, I have to say. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't say if I wasn't in it. Either. I know that accountant in you would not say it if you didn't believe it. And thank you for that. It's very encouraging. It is a labor of love. And like you, I've got the job that um, probably I was meant to have. Mm -hmm. Avery did a great job. Therese, we'll be seeing you soon. Uh, mark your calendars. November 9th through the 11th, we'll be in Washington, D.C. at the Grand Hyatt for the 58th annual convention. I want to thank Ingrid Saunders Jones, formerly of the Coca-Cola Company, and all of the folks associated with Coke over on North Avenue. I missed coming over to headquarters, but uh, <laughs> we appreciate the support. And look, tomorrow at noon, there will be another webinar, and that subject will be on keeping your customers happy. It's one thing to get them, but you've got to know how to keep them. So join us tomorrow at 1130 for another installment in what we call Millennial Entrepreneurs. Thank you all and good night. Take care. Have a great week. You too. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you, William. Oh, and just to make everybody jealous, I'm actually headed to St. Thomas tomorrow to talk about supplier diversity. <laughs> <laughs> don't you need a bodyguard? Don't you need somebody? Don't you need an accomplice? I can carry your bag. That's a good. That's a that's a side benefit. <laughs> Enjoy it. You Take care, guys. Bye bye.